Uh, yeah, I think so. If you can see my video. Uh, uh, yeah, there I am. All right, so just share the screen. Okay. So Thomas is going to talk about goals for self-replicating neural networks. Exactly. Thank you very much. I think let's start. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna just roll everything back a bit and uh, go back to ALIFE 2018 for, for a minute. Um, there's been a paper by uh, Chang and Lipson and they asked, they basically wanted to use a neural network, a neural network like this one you can see in this picture and um, use uh, as an input for this neural network, another neural network of the same structure, ideally the same neural network. So have a neural network that can kind of be applied to itself. There's just a slight problem with that, that it's kind of obvious. Um, a neural network like the one we see here uh, already has 20 weights, which is like the minimum parameters I need to define this network, but it only has four inputs. So that's a problem. I cannot directly input the weights, yeah, input 20 weights into four inputs. So they came up with the solution. It, it's also rather simple. Um, it's just that we apply, we could apply this network iteratively to every single weight in another network and so uh, for to this end um, apply a certain meaning to all of these inputs and outputs and the idea is that like in the first input we just input the old value of one single weight of another network and the one output just represents a new value like a value update of the one weight of uh, another neural network and to help the network recognize where within the other network it is, it is, we have a few additional parameters that just describe the other network structure and tell this network um, where's the layer of the weight it's been input right now, uh, what's the cell and what's the position. This is just like the localization of the input weight. And with a network like this, what we can do is, of course, take another neural network and iterate over every single weight. So you can see when it can apply it to weight number zero, which would be the one here at the top left, and then update it with a new value and then achieve a slightly different neural network with an updated weight. The same we do for weight number one and so on. I think you can imagine this process. Um, and by doing so, of course, we can also input the very same network. As you can see now, both networks to the left are green. So we just input the, it's as an input for this network, we use its own weights. And um, then usually you might end up with some different weights and thus some diff if the network is randomly initialized, it's very <laughs> uh, improbable that it just be an identity function. So we end up with some different weights and that's such a little bit different network as an output. But of course, and this is what the Chang and Lipson aimed for, there are networks uh, that represent this property. There are networks where if I input their own weights, their output is their own weights again. And this is what we call a self-replicating neural network because um, given itself as an input, it outputs itself as well. And the funny thing is these networks arise just by starting with random neural networks and applying them on to, the, to themselves. So if we execute this process, this is an experiment we did ourselves, we end up with something like this. Uh, in the C plots like this throughout my talk, so in the X and Y axis, we reduce the 20 or more weights of a neural network via PCA to just two axes that we can print it. And on the Z axis to the top, you could just see uh, the, the course of evolution, that's our time axis. And if you apply these networks to each other, you can see that they kind of converge and they converge around a zero network which is due to some properties uh, we won't discuss here. So now let's jump to ALIFE 2019. This is a paper by my, me and my team. Um, what we did, we added training via backpropagation to the setup. So we gave these networks a slight um, training to help them uh, um, reproduce the one weight they were given. So we trained them for self-replication a little bit. And this, of course, helped the process uh, greatly and allowed us to observe behavior like this. All of these networks are self-replicating networks again, but they're all different ones and they're all different from zero. So that was kind of interesting. And we did one more thing. We introduced tubes, which is just a not so fancy word for artificial chemistry systems. So we had multiples of these randomly initialized networks and have them interact with each other by inputting the weights of one network into the other. And the output generated by the network 
having been written back into the first network. All right. And if we build soups like this, we also observe some interesting behavior. Again, <laughs> everything uh, produced by these soups, basically everything is ends up being a self-replicating network again, but we see some clustering, we see some patterns of behavior. All right, so this is the backstory. Let's move on to what we are uh, introducing today. Um, what this work is about is just extending the network we previously had. You see, we are now have six inputs instead of the four we used. And what we extend the network with are these two inputs to the bottom here. And we call them task inputs. So we give this network, in addition to this self replicating setup, we give it an additional task that might be anything. Uh, for our examples, it's usually addition. So we give it two numbers and we expect the network, if it is given these two numbers, to return the sum of these two numbers. A very, very simple task, but we're just getting started with this research. And um, what we also did, just to let you know, we altered the network structure a little bit, um, just to introduce some more layers, have it be a little bit deeper. And reducing the bandwidth actually make training harder again. We have a plot for this in the um, paper, but I'm going to save it here. All right, so what happens exactly if we have a setup like this, we have two ways to use it. First, we can um, input the um, value of another network and some position data to it, as we did before. And then we just leave the task inputs at zero. And then we expect the network to produce a new value for the weight. And this we can train for self-replication just as we did before. And then we have another mode where we leave all the weight and positional inputs at zero. And we just input two task inputs like here. And then um, we expect the network to return the output of the task and we can train for this as well. All right. So if we do this, this plot just shows, yeah, it works. Uh, we have some learning phase. As you can see, the network makes a kind of curve around there, but it then ends up being stable where the point where it's self-replicating and it's fulfilling the task. And we also analyzed if this makes it any difficult, uh, any more difficult for the network to be trained. And obviously, yes, it does. So we can see um, at the x-axis, you see how many times we train the network for, and then on the y-axis, how many fixed points we found. And you can see that we, if we just train for fixed points, that is networks that can self-replicate, but nothing else. Of course, training is easier, faster, but we can also train for these goal fixed points, networks that can self-replicate and um, fulfill the goal. And this also works kind of well, just a little bit slower. All right, we have also observed that we can change the task alongside training. As you can see here, this network was trained on one task and then the task is changed, which makes it take another huge detour and then end up being stable again, uh, which is kind of nice. We analyzed if we can change tasks often back and forth. And yes, we can. You can see here the uh, weight change uh, after each um, task change. And we have one interesting observation that, see that these networks uh, stay kind of fresh. We would have expected the weight change to decline after some time, especially since with the third change, we reintroduce previous tasks that have already been trained on, but they don't, which is an interesting property maybe for the future work. All right, there's one more thing uh, to this research. Uh, again, we considered soups, otherwise I wouldn't have introduced them at the beginning of the talk. And um, additional to these, um, additional to the interactions I showed you before, where I input the weights of one particle of the soup into another one, we added an additional interaction called learn. In this case, uh, two particles are fed with the same input. And for both, the output is generated, but one of these networks, in this case, in this case, the green network, might be trained to achieve the same output as the blue network. It's kind of like an imitation learning thing. So one network can learn from another network. Um, what does this do? At first, not so much. We still have very similar results. We observe less clustering than in the previous experiments from the years before. Uh, but in the end, all particles fulfill the task and are self-replicating. You know, plot like this. And as you can see, there are lots of these particles spread within the uh, weight space. Um, so we have one more interesting experiment. In this case, we introduced something we called a beacon. A beacon is a special particle that is uh, trained on its own for self-replication and for the task we want to solve. In this case, as I told you, addition. Um, but it cannot be influenced by any other network. So it 
cannot be so so no weights can be written into it as there could be for other particles so it's basically on its own except for one things one thing the other networks can see the speaking particle and because we have for example this learn from interactions they can actually learn the task from the beaten particle from from this beacon particle which is very nice it's an instance of like um guided self-organization we kind of think of it like that um yeah, so we don't have to introduce the auxiliary, the, the additional task to all single particles for the training, but actually it suffices if we introduce the task just to this one beaten, beaten particle that remains constant throughout the whole evolution. And still in the end, all the particles end up being again self-replicating and fulfilling the task goal. And again, we asked the question in uh, learning from a beacon, is this more difficult or even easier than just being given the task explicitly and not very surprisingly it is a bit more difficult as you can see here again on this plot we have on the uh, x-axis the time steps we trained various networks for and um, on the y-axis you basically see uh, the success of the training and you can see that um, and the blue line is in soup that is just uh, where all all single particles are training for the, the additional task on their own. And as you can see, it converges rather quickly to achieve basically no loss on the additional task. And then we have various steps. The green line is what I've showed you before. It's um, particles that are learning only from the beacon. And you can see they take much, much longer because of course you need to wait for these random interactions to come up to actually have an opportunity to learn from the beacon particle uh, but it works after a lot of time steps we actually end up with the same result and we also have like gradual behavior in between where we focus learning on the beacon but it's not our primary source of knowledge all right uh, this, uh, wait a minute all right so um <laughs> what i kind of didn't answer so far is why do we do this and the thing is, of course, just training networks to add up to numbers is not very useful on its own. But we have like some high hopes where this might end up in the future. And I just want to bring a few of them uh, to this talk, maybe so they can be published in a future edition of A Life. Uh, maybe by, by us, we are at it as well, but maybe other people are interested as well. So, one thing we find very interesting is to go from um, soups to organisms. Right now, all these particles are trained on a task for themselves. And we think there might be ways to come uh, to have these particles actually work together, not just um, learning from each other, doing the same thing, but actually specialize. Um, other interesting things, uh, as I mentioned, is this lifelong learning idea. We've noticed that because we think because these networks are constantly trained on um, the self-replication task they kind of keep a certain freshness within the weights but we uh, which might be helpful for other learning tasks but uh, very importantly we still need to verify that for more basic experiments but it's definitely a thing where one might get into constantly retraining neural networks and see how they work then um, another thing is um, Using these, as you, as you probably know, this uh, approach is kind of inspired by other artificial chemistries, usually based on lambda calculus or on automata. And for these very concise mathematical expressions exist. And um, this instance of self-replication kind of allows to maybe build something similar consisting of neural networks, but we're not quite there yet complexity-wise. And lastly, what I find very interesting is that we can see um, even without the additional task, these networks do something, they learn something, um, and they seem to have a tendency to want to be at a certain uh, state, even without us telling them which state they should want to be at. Um, so we think that we can use this also for other learning problems. All right, but uh, that's just the vision for future ALIFE conferences, maybe. And uh, for this ALIFE conference, I want to say thank you very much for listening to this. And I'm very happy to ask any questions. Uh, answer Thanks, any Thomas. questions, sorry. Asking is your part. <laughs> oh, by all means, ask, ask yourself some questions. <laughs> <laughs> Too um, much self-replication, sorry. <laughs> yeah, indeed. 
Uh, thank you, Thomas, uh, and thank you for uh, staying again. Thank you for staying exactly on time. Okay, let's let's open it up to the audience. I'm not seeing much from the Zoom while I'm in sharing mode, so. Uh. No. Um. Okay. Anyone? Okay, I think we're maybe suffering so from an, an end of end of the week, end of the end of the conference fatigue, perhaps. <laughs> Definitely, I don't think we need to urge anyone. I've got an email as well. You can find it in the in the paper. <laughs> right. So okay. if anything, so, right. any interest comes up, just drop a note. So thank you, Sina, for for the comment. Really cool project. <laughs> don't have a specific question, but thank you for the nice presentation. Please join me in, in thanking Thomas. <laughs>